Capacitors have many uses throughout circuits, but one of the most common and important use is what are called decoupling or bypass capacitors, and sometimes filter capacitors. Recall that capacitors store energy by having two conductive layers and the insulating layer between that causes charge that's applied to kind of stick to it. And so what ends up happening is, as charge flows through the circuit and the capacitor is connected in parallel, it tends to smooth out the voltage, it resists changes in voltage. Different capacitors have different capacities, capacitances. They have different construction, which means they have different response rates. Basically, each capacitor of a different type and size responds to different voltage change rates and causes a different effect on those voltage change rates. Think about a graph of voltage over time. You have one axis, which is time, and one axis, which is voltage. So up on this side is positive voltage, and down on this side is negative. So you might have your alternating current. It goes between positive and negative and positive and negative. So this would be voltage changing over time. This could be a signal. Now, if you hook a capacitor up to this, very little is going to happen because the capacitor is going to charge back and forth and back and forth because it'll charge one end being positive but then when that end becomes negative, it'll basically suck the charge back out of it and charge it the other way. So the capacitor won't do much. So while capacitors do have a purpose in alternating current, we're going to leave that for a far future video. Right now we're going to discuss capacitors' most common usage in direct current. So here's our voltage over time graph again, but this time it's only positive. So we've got zero and positive and there is no negative. So let's say you had a direct current over time. It's going to be kind of like that. There's going to be some waviness and of course this waviness because of my hand. But let's say your current goes like doo -doo 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 -doo, whoop, doo -doo 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 -doo. and this is where everybody in the neighborhood all turned their TVs on at once because all of a sudden the Andy Griffith marathon was starting. So the power company had to spin up their little extra generator for a second to make sure that they could feed the neighborhood. So you might view this as a signal. It's not a wild signal, but it's a signal and this happens all the time. There's all kinds of variations and little ups and downs. And this is why I love batteries so much because a battery isn't a affected by anything outside of itself. It just has a voltage and over time it just goes nice and smooth. But batteries obviously have their limitations. So wall power it is. So what does a capacitor do to this? Well, I'll just draw it below so you can see it. Just imagine the numbers are the same. So a capacitor would do pretty much nothing here because the capacitor would be charged. Actually, let's pretend this is the start of time. So at the beginning, if this is what the rest of the circuit sees and you have this capacitor at the start, at the beginning you're going to be like down here and then go because the capacitor is charging and it's going to be a lot quicker than that, but you get the point. So the capacitor is going to suck up the voltage right at the start and then it will be fine and the circuit will continue on. But then this is going to happen and the voltage is going to go meow. But now the capacitor is there charged and ready. And so the power supply's voltage has dipped, but the capacitor is all charged up. So it's going to go like, wait, no, no, I got it. And it's going to go up and then it's going to feed the circuit and the power supply will kick back in and the capacitor will charge back up. And then there you go. So it smooths it out. Another example. Let's go back to our alternating current. So we discussed rectifiers, and that's one common use of these capacitors. A full bridge rectifier takes your alternating current and turns it into direct current, which looks like this. So what does the capacitor do? Well, the capacitor is going to turn it into something that kind of looks like this. And depending on the capacitors you use, it'll, you know, be a lot better. It's almost like a sawtooth wave. I just have trouble drawing it. But the point is, you can see it basically smoothed it out. If you add more capacitors, bigger ones and smaller ones, it'll end up looking more like this. Now what's this variance? You know, this variance can end up being small enough that it doesn't even matter. That's the point. It won't be perfect. You can't get it perfect. But if this variance has no effect on your circuit, well then you're good, aren't you? So basically what happens is the capacitors suck up enough charge to charge up and then as every dip happens, they supply some, and every rise happens, they charge back up. So overall, they'll give you a slightly lower value, but you can compensate because you're taking the wall voltage of 120 to 220 and bringing it down to five. So you've got plenty of headroom. So you can put through as much power as you need to make sure that it always supplies it. So like you have your linear voltage regulator that puts it out, you know, you give it seven volts, and then it always regulates it down to five, or you have a switching power supply. So if there's a lack, it just switches faster. We'll discuss all those things when we discuss those types of power supplies. But this is what a capacitor does. Now, some internals 
Real quick, and I'm not going to be doing any math. There's no math here. I'm going to show you a mathematical thing, but we're not going to do math, so relax. If you have taken any medium level course in math, including high school, that's where I learned it, you may have heard of something called a Taylor series. Basically, you can have Imagine here, you know your graph of y equals x, you know you've got a plot. Well, let's say y equals a whole bunch of crazy stuff that you can't make head or tail of. And it's really complex and it's really hard to calculate and it wraps up all these concepts. But you can approximate it with something called a Taylor series. A O X O plus A1 X1 plus A2 X2 plus da 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 da. Now, the superscript, the number on the top, is exponentiation. x to the power of 0 is 1, so this is just ao. And now this is a1 times x to the 1 is x, and x squared, x cubed. The subscript just labels the value. So that's easy to remember. If the number is higher, that's exponentiation. If the number is lower, it's a label, like, you know, v in, or, you know, x first, or whatever you want. The subscript is a label, and in this case, it matches the exponent, so it's easy to keep track. That's why we did it. But the point is, this is what's called a polynomial, and you create higher and higher and higher and higher orders, and you can approximate any graph you want. So, for example, uh, you know, if you've only got the x to the zero, let's say it stops there. Well, that's a line, and then you've got a parabola, and then you've got one of these, and then you've got, you know, one of these, and it gets it's more complex and you can tailor the numbers, no pun intended, so that within a range that function approximates the function you want to greater and greater and greater efficiency. Well there's another kind of approximation called the Fourier series. The Taylor series is just a polynomial. The Fourier series is sinusoidal. You know your sine and cosine, these functions? You know your sine is going to look like this and your cosine is going to look like this. Sine and cosine are exactly the same thing, one's just offset a little bit. The cosine starts at 1, the sine starts at 0, they're exactly the same thing. It's called a different phase. We'll discuss that later. But the point is, it's waves. Waves in the ocean, electromagnetic waves, you know, your alternating current is a wave. It's waves, that's all it is, up and down. You can approximate functions with waves as well. You may have heard of something called a fast Fourier transformation, FFT. Uh, this is for signal analysis, frequency analysis, and all this other stuff. This is how filters work. Like if you have a high pass or low pass filter in your software, what happens is it splits a complex wave using the Fourier system and combines it back down after adjusting the individual frequencies. So let's say you have this wave, right? And then let's say you want to make this wave with other easier to work with waves. So let's say you have like this one and it's so tall and then you've got this one and it's so tall and you've got this one and it's so tall and then you've got this one and it's so tall. Basically, you've got waves of different amplitude. Amplitude is how high it is. And different phase. Phase is how much it's shifted, right? So you've got, if you have a wave like this, and then if you have a wave like this, it's shifted over a little bit, that's slightly out of phase. So just like you have the Taylor series, where you have, you know, x to the 3 with a number multiplied at x to the 4, x to the 5, and you just adjust essentially the amplitude of that part of the Taylor expansion, this is the same thing with the Fourier expansion. You just take a wave of a different frequency, and you add them together, frequencies and phases, with amplitudes. So every frequency has a phase and an amplitude. You add them together and you'll get a more complex wave, and you just keep adding terms and adding terms and adding terms until it's as precise as you want. So a real world example would be my voice. My voice is made up of different frequencies. If I go high, it's higher frequencies, low is lower frequencies. But let's say I'm snapping while I'm talking like this. Those are combined, you're hearing them as one complex waveform. But your brain can obviously separate them. You hear two different things. This one is a lower pitched sound, it's lower waves. So if I wanted to filter that out, let's say that I was talking really high like this to make sure that all of the frequencies of my voice are much higher than this. So what I do is I 
use the Fourier math, which obviously we're not going to discuss right now. It's very complex, but really cool though. But I split it. When you split it, you get the frequencies, amplitudes, phases, and you look at the frequencies of the low stuff and of the high stuff, right? You've basically taken this and split it apart into its constituent parts, right? Instead of seeing an atom of oxygen, you see a bunch of protons and neutrons and electrons and all this other crap just spread out on a table right in front of you. And then you say, okay, well, I want to get rid of the snapping. So I just delete all of the lower frequency stuff. I'm going to pick a threshold. Everything below this, delete. And then you smush it together again. And it won't be perfect because there's some variation. But for the most part, you will have done what's called a high pass filter. It allows the high frequencies to pass through. So that is one thing called a noise filter. Have you ever heard of a noise filter? Where like if you have, you know, hissing in your microphone and what you do is you go in a program like Audacity and you select some of the noise and then you say delete that noise and you get some weird artifacts, but it mostly deletes the noise and leaves the voice, you know, good enough. So what it does is it takes that noise and it does a Fourier transformation to figure out what constitutes that noise. What are the frequencies, amplitudes, phases of that noise? And obviously it varies per second, but it gets an approximation. It gets a rough one. So then you do a Fourier transformation on the whole sound, delete the ones that were the noise, and smush it together again. So, you know, again, it's not perfect, but it works out. This is actually how capacitors work. Different capacitors, if you imagine, now it doesn't actually, you know, do some sort of computation here, it's physical properties, but it works the same. If you imagine a voltage signal being split into its constituent parts by the Fourier series, different capacitors will allow different frequencies of that signal to pass largely unmolested and the others will be smoothed out. So you could have high ones, low ones, whatever. Capacitors can be used as filters like that. A larger capacity capacitor will tend to filter out lower frequency noise, whereas a low capacity capacitor will tend to filter out high frequency noise. So we had our rectified AC signal 60 times a second. You can see that's pretty low frequency. So you get a big capacitor and it's going to smooth smooth out these big old lumps and it's going to leave you with still a noisy signal but much smoother. So now you've got noise that's smaller bumps and if you split this up into your Fourier series you'll see there's a lot of high frequency components. So then you get your smaller capacitors that don't have as much capacity, but they have a faster response. They start supplying voltage and charge faster, are going to smooth that out. So that's why you use a big and a small. You smooth the low frequency stuff and you smooth the high frequency stuff. This is what capacitors are used for most of the time, smoothing. So you'll see something like a voltage regulator. Let's just pretend this is a voltage regulator. Then you have your wall power. Let's pretend this is already rectified and filtered and this is this is a nice, you know, higher input from a wall ward or something. And then you've got your actual circuit over here and you're going to have some capacitors. Let's say you've got one there and you've got one there and you're just going to connect them in parallel. Obviously a much simplified diagram, but you'll see that the capacitors are in parallel. They're not stopping anything from happening like the series regulator is. But this one is a big one and this one is a small one. So what happens here. This one is in charge of, see this is before the regulator, this one is in charge of making sure that dips in the power supply from the wall when everybody turns on their washing machines at the same time are smoothed out. So this one sits here charged, big capacity, slow response but big capacity, and then the power dips and this thing kicks in, you know, make sure you have your, your diode in there so it doesn't backflow. And then so it's going to supply the regulator mostly well enough until the power kicks back in. And this is going to smooth out those lumps. This one is responsible for the high frequency noise, the little, what you call ripple. And this is what's going directly into, for example, your integrated circuit that wants a nice clean voltage. So this one is in charge of making sure that the unregulated power supply is there, that this thing has everything it needs to work with. This is the seven volt. And to make sure this thing stays as close to seven volts as possible so that this thing has its headroom where it's taking seven to five. So it always has that headroom to make sure it stays at five. And then this one takes care of all the little variations that this thing can't stop. Because this thing, this thing is the powerhouse. It's making sure that it's rough and ready and, and, and make sure that the cement is still flowing out of the truck and doesn't worry about the little lumps. This is the filter getting rid of the little lumps. You know, the one little guy with the little brush to make sure that the 
integrated circuit gets its nice clean supply because this one doesn't have to worry about supplying when there's a power outage. This one is just making sure that when it goes a little high, when it goes a little low, smooths it out. And you'll see this all over the place. Every time you see a capacitor in parallel, that's probably what's happening. So this is what a bypass or decoupling capacitor is for. They call it decoupling because the idea is whatever the power supply elsewhere in the circuit is doing, going up, going down, whatever, you know, some other part of the circuit kicks in and the power supply goes <clears throat> trying to supply it. This capacitor in this part of the circuit, because you might have more than one voltage regulator, but this capacitor capacitor in this part of the circuit is going to handle that. Just like I said, if your household gets a dip because everybody else turned on their TVs, it's the same thing. If some other part of the circuit suddenly turns on, like the system decided that it's getting too hot, so it turns on the fan, and the fan starts sucking power, and, you know, the, the main regulator, transformer, whatever, has trouble keeping up immediately, the other parts of the circuit, such as the control circuit, are going to have their big capacitor that's going to supply voltage, ex extra voltage to catch up, in the split second it takes for, you know, whatever other main power supply to kick back in and catch up. And this is just the guy cleaning up after. So that's why they call it decoupling capacitors, to make sure that this part of the circuit, whatever it's doing, is mostly functionally separate from the rest. So that whatever the rest of the circuit is doing, this guy doesn't have to think about it. And they call it a bypass capacitor for roughly the same reason. I think decoupling is a little more clear, but yeah. But you know how I said these capacitors respond to different frequencies. It's the same thing with sound, how I was saying you can filter out high and low parts of the voice. You do the same thing in sound circuits and you can use capacitors to do that. So you find the right capacitor for the right voltage range that is going to get rid of the parts that you don't want. And you do it just like this. And it's essentially the same thing. You know, the capacitor is supplying voltage when it's low, it's taking voltage when it goes back up. But the effect of it, instead of thinking of the voltage as supplying a circuit, Think of the voltage as a signal to make a circuit do something. And so you're smoothing that signal instead of the supply. And the only real difference is how many amps are going through. So it's exactly the same physical principle. You're just using it in a different way. You're doing something different with it. You can smooth your rectified AC power to make sure that your integrated circuits are happy. You can smooth certain frequencies out of a signal to make sure that, let's say, you have a regular speaker and then you have a subwoofer. So you could split the signal, run a high pass filter on one that goes to the regular speaker so it's not trying to replicate all these low sounds, it's just doing what it knows best. And then you do the low pass filter, you know, just whatever other capacitor. And of course filter circuits get more complex, but you could do it with just capacitors it would be good enough to functionally perform. But then you have your, your low pass on the other side that sends just the low signals to the subwoofer. So you essentially split the signal by duplicating it and then cutting half of one and the other half of the other using capacitors. Now I can't demonstrate this right now because I don't have an oscilloscope. So right now you're gonna have to take my word for it. But as time goes on, I will sneak in demonstrations of this as we make circuits because capacitors are everywhere. Decoupling capacitors are everywhere. And every time they show up, you'll see it. And eventually, I'll have my oscilloscope and I can show you directly. Until then, be seeing you.